I think one of the things that we're struggling with in the present moment is a general lack of agency. Um, and this is really made obvious by technologies that were supposed to help us and educate us, but have instead devolved into social media that is used to manipulate people. And that is a failure of, of understanding how those systems work. In thinking about intelligence, one of the things that I came to understand is that intelligence is not something that happens inside the head. Um, different organisms, different beings manifest their intelligences based on um, their experiences and on their environments. Um, and so the first thing that matters to your intelligence is, 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 is your body plan, your embodiment, how you, how you interact with the world, how you touch it, how it comes to you and how you, how you go to it. Um, and so even with beings that are very close to us, like um, other apes, um, they have very different kinds of intelligence because perhaps they're arboreal, because they live in the trees, so that they might relate to their environment in a far more three-dimensional way than they do. So the sort of intelligence tests, um, which are very difficult anyway, uh, and don't work very well on humans, but when we set them for other apes, they simply don't make sense because spatially they perceive the world in such a radically different way, even though they're 99 percent genetically the same as us. And so when you start then to go into other creatures, when you go into other mammals, you go beyond the mammals, when you go into reptiles and other creatures, when you go into the sea and imagine a completely aqueous environment, um, a complete, uh, the undersea environment, where you know, creatures are, are living within a completely different medium, then once again they will have a completely different kind of intelligence. Um, uh, that may be structured physically entirely different as well. Um, the octopus, which has become kind of famous as an intelligent being for various reasons, the octopus's um, neurons extend all the way through its entire body uh, so that it actually, the, the limbs of the octopus are controlled um, independently of the central mind. And then you can go beyond the animals and you can start to think about the intelligences of plants um, because plants have many of the abilities that we associate with intelligence. Um, they, they hear, they perceive the world around them, they, they, they hear sound, they perceive light, but they also uh, remember. Uh, they store information about the environment. Um, they respond to the activities of other plants around them. Um, and they um, are capable of um, uh, shifting their, their plans and patterns of behaviors based on what they encounter. Essentially, they do all the things that in animals we call intelligent. Um, and so for me, intelligence really is something that is uh, a process that rather than being kind of locked inside individual heads and certainly rather than being a thing that only humans do is something that's embodied, uh, something that's relational, something that occurs in our interactions and something that occurs everywhere. That there's no such thing as the natural. Uh, there's no such thing as, as, as us separated from our environment, from the world around us. Um, and so by that logic as well there can be no real such thing for me as artificial intelligence um, because Intelligence is not a singular kind of unique quality, it's something which is done. And so anything that is doing intelligence, that's intelligence. It's not something that could be conceived of as being artificial or unnatural, because everything is natural, because it occurs in the world. Um, but what it is, this thing that we're calling AI, is, um, is machine intelligence, right? It's the kind of intelligence that's done by certain kinds of machines. And so we can understand it in the way that we understand the intelligence of other beings to some extent, by thinking about their evolution, their environment, the pressures that have been brought to bear on them, where they come from, their goals, their intentions, uh, the ideas that they have, their ideology, all of these things produce the kind of intelligence that they do. Um, but what is, you know, what, what's key about it is that it will always be, like all these other intelligences that I've talked about, embodied and relational. It will come from the form that they take and the relationships that they have. Um, it will also always be different from human intelligence. And this is why I think we use this term artificial intelligence, because we always have this belief that what we're talking about is artificial general intelligence, i.e. artificial human intelligence. And that will never be that either. It will always be something else. It will be this machine intelligence because it's being done by machines. One thing I think about a lot is the extent to which the world has become more apparently complex in the last kind of 10 or 20 years. I don't like terms like information overload or things like this because I don't think the world has become more complicated. It's become more visibly complicated because we've built this incredible technology for showing us the world in this kind of macroscope. 
uh, at all these different levels at once and so much of it at once and it feels very intense. The information has always been there, it's now just like right up in our faces. You know? and, uh, uh, and that's happened at the same time as um, there's been a complete collapse in like meaningful critical education. Uh, well, again, collapse. Maybe it was never really there, but it's really, really necessary now. The tools we need to parse and understand that information. Because very, very few of us understand how that process has occurred. There's a definite difference if you are um, engaged with those kind of systems uh, meaningfully. Like if you, if you understand how computer code works, it gives you an advantage in parsing those systems. It doesn't make you ma magically morally better. It doesn't mean you're going to be a good person with those systems. It doesn't mean you'll be necessarily politically engaged with them, but it does give you a different level of access to them. Machines are not very good at communicating with humans. Uh, they're just not. Uh, and they won't be because they're another species, effectively. They're another type of being. So we'll, we, we work out these languages, these ways of speaking to them, but human language is probably not a very good way of doing it. You know, but what the machine intelligences are really good at doing is things that we're really not good at doing. Um, and some of them are, are really terrible, like finding large oil and gas reserves and working out how to get them out of the ground for the least cost. Uh, and some of them are, are really powerful, like working out kind of folding proteins for new kinds of medicines or cancer treatments and so on and so forth. Like they are very good at certain kinds of things. But they are, they're different to us. What I see a lot of people struggling with is the same issues with regard to the climate crisis as I see with regard to the kind of technological landscape, which is that they simply look at this huge, vast system in which they know they are utterly enmeshed that we're all involved in, and they feel they have no agency. And agency is the, agency is the feeling in, uh, that you understand the forces shaping your life, and that you are capable of shaping your own life in turn, that you have some say in the outcome of your life.